Before we begin the broadcast today, I want to once again encourage all of our viewers and listeners to consider donating to the New Zealand Disaster Fund. Please visit www.redcross.org.nz today and help those in need. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Dwayne Burkhardt and you are watching and or listening to Season 2, Episode 2 of The Rugby Report. And I'm delighted to inform you that there is indeed a lot of rugby to report. So let's go! We're going to start the show down under where Round 1 of Super Rugby Pacific is now in the books. And the season kicked off with a stunner as the defending champion Christchurch Crusaders, the most dominant team in league history by far, got smoked by the Waikato Chiefs. The Crusaders came out strong and took an early 10-0 lead and then didn't score again. The Chiefs got on the board just before the half to make it 10-7, but then they went on a staggering 24-0 run in the second half. On the road. And what about Damian McKenzie? The last time McKenzie was in Orange Theory Stadium was for the 2021 championship game between these two teams, and even though McKenzie was arguably the MVP of the league that year and had literally single-handedly won at least four of the Chiefs' games that season, i.e. they wouldn't have been anywhere near the championship game without him, he had a frankly disastrous big game. And you had to wonder how that would affect him in his first Super Rugby game in two years. Yeah, it didn't. At all. McKenzie was a perfect 4-for-4 four four in conversions and added a penalty goal in there somewhere, but most importantly, he showed absolutely no signs of rust or concerns, and the full-time score was Crusaders 10, Chiefs 31. Forgive me for ever doubting you boys, what a game. Next up, we go to Sydney, where the Waratahs opened their season at home against the Brumbies. And folks, I know I said that the Taz were much improved, but I was still shocked by how close this game was. The Brumbies needed all they had to eke out a narrow win in Sydney. Are the Taz just that much better this year, or did the Brumbies stumble? No, the Brumbies played well. The Waratahs were simply that much better than they have been. The Brumbies did prevail, but it was not a walk in the park. The full-time score was Waratahs 25, Brumbies 31. We hop back over to New Zealand next for what was, by far, the most exciting game of the weekend. It was a battle of the expansion teams as Moana Pacifica opened at home against the Fijian Drua, and these two teams wasted no time demonstrating that they are still very evenly matched. I thought the Pacifica offense would prevail, and for most of the game, it did. But in the end, it was that grit, fight, and determination that the Drua showed throughout last season that made the difference. In the end, they scored late and took the victory on the road. Full-time score, Pacifica 34, Drua 36. Next up, we head down to Dunedin, where my Highlanders were the victims of a good old-fashioned butt-kicking in their opening game against the Blues. Folks, the Blues are deep and talented, and with a backfield that includes players like Bowden Barrett, Caleb Clark, Rico Iwani, and Mark Talia. Well, this team is literally built for offensive domination. And dominate is what they did. The Blues simply ran over the Landers for pretty much the entire game. And if the Blues can stay healthy this year, <laughs> watch out. Full-time score, Highlanders 20, Blues, wait for it, 60. Ouch. Next up, we head into Queensland for a game that was actually a lot closer than the final score implies. The Hurricanes blew into town to play the Reds in a game that was missing a bunch of the players who I thought were going to be playing when I made my prediction last week. The biggest absence, pun intended, would be Taniela Tupo, who shocked this rugby reporter this past week, not by signing with Australian Rugby through 2025, I expected that, but by getting traded to the Melbourne Rebels. Tupo's departure leaves a huge hole in the Reds' front row. Seriously, it's a big hole. 
Just a very large man. Also not playing in the game was James O'Connor, who took a seat so that the Reds could start Tom Linaw, son of Aussie rugby legend Michael Linaw, in the 10 spot. The 21-year-old Linaw, or Tommy Turbo as he has been known in Europe, was signed just days ago and was impressive in his Super Rugby debut. In fact, the Reds looked pretty good in this game, leading for the vast bulk of the first 30 minutes and trailing by three at the half. But here's the thing. Rugby is an 80-minute game, and the Reds clearly left something important in the sheds when they came back from halftime because in the second half, the Hurricanes scored 31 unanswered points and stormed their way to a big opening victory on the road. Full-time score, Reds 13, Hurricanes 47. Finally, we head to Perth for one of the few games this weekend that at least ended the way I thought it would. But it sure didn't look like it for most of the game. The Western Force hosted the Melbourne Rebels in what I predicted would be a feisty affair between two teams that do not like each other. Now, I thought that the boys from Perth would be able to use the Force to down the Rebels. And yes, the Star Wars jokes just write themselves when these two teams play. But that didn't happen. In fact, for most of the game, the Rebels ran, and it looked like the Force were headed to the dark side. But late in the game, the Force awakened. I'm sorry, I can't help it. But they did get just enough to escape with the victory, and the full-time score was Force 34, Rebels 27. Now, for those keeping track, my record in round one was 2 and 4. I know. That record, by the way, as anyone who has been watching the Rugby Report and or following my online predictions long enough knows, is my first losing week in more than two years. So, ow. But let's shake that off now and look ahead to round two of Super Rugby Pacific. And in round two, the league has a very special plan for us, as all six games this weekend will be played in the same stadium. And I'd like to personally thank the league for that because, wow, does that make creating the game graphics for the video version of this podcast way easier. Round two will take place in Melbourne, Australia at Amy Park, or as I call it, Seagull Stadium. And if you've ever watched a game being played there before, you know why I call it that. Game one features a big South Island battle between the Crusaders and the Highlanders. Both teams are coming off disappointing losses in round one, but the Crusaders are still a dominant team with lots of talent, while the Landers look to be in the early stages of rebuilding. I love my Highlanders, but the Crusaders are the team that will bounce back this week. Crusaders win. Game 2 features the hometown Melbourne Rebels taking on the Wellington Hurricanes. The Hurricanes were at Category 5 in the second half of their game last week against the Reds, while the Rebels fell just short in a key rivalry matchup. The Rebels will be at home, where they desperately need to win and excite the local fans. But I just can't see them beating this Hurricanes team. Hurricanes win. The final game on Saturday pits Moana Pacifica against the Chiefs. The Chiefs, of course, are coming off of their stunning win against the Crusaders, while Pacifica will be grumbling after their heartbreaking narrow loss to the Drua. But will that loss be enough motivation to get them past Damian McKenzie and the Chiefs? I doubt it. Chiefs go 2-0, and and they win this game. Sunday's action begins with the Fijian Drua taking on the Waratahs. Both teams impressed me in round one, even though the Taz did so in a losing effort, and I think that this is the toughest match of the week to call. But I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm going to predict that the newly resurgent Waratahs will show up big and will prevail this week over the Drua. Taz win. Next up, the Blues play the Brumbies, and as much as I'm looking forward to seeing the Waratahs and Drua game, this game is my vote for Game of the Week. The Brumbies struggled to beat the Waratahs last week, while the Blues put on an offensive clinic and simply embarrassed my Highlanders. The Brumbies have been a team to beat in Australia for the majority of the last decade, and I'm certainly not ready to call for their downfall just yet. But against the Blues offense that we saw last week? No way. This should be a good game, but the Blues will end up on top. 
Blues win. Finally, the weekend celebration in Melbourne concludes with the Western Force taking on the Queensland Reds. The Force barely took down their arch nemesis, the Rebels, in round one, where the Reds fell apart late and got their butts kicked by the Hurricanes. So what happens this week? Well, much as I want the Force to be with the boys from Perth, I think the Reds are simply a much better team right now, and they will be coming into this game ticked. So I predict that it will be a rough day for the Force, and the Reds will right their ship and end up 1-1. One one. Reds win. Now let's switch hemispheres and have a look at the MLR. The last two games of round two are literally being played as we record this episode, so the standings here do not reflect those results. But as of this moment, we have the Seattle Seawolves undefeated and at the top of the table in the West, followed by Houston, San Diego, and Utah, with Dallas and Chicago at the bottom and still looking up for their first wins. In the East, again not including the results from later today, New England, D.C., and Atlanta are on top, while Toronto, New York, and New Orleans are outside looking in. Next, we'll cross the Atlantic Pond and check in with the URC table, where we see exactly the same table we saw last week. And really, the most exciting race is still for that last playoff spot, where Connacht is still clinging to a one-point lead over both the Cardiff Blues and Benetton. Now finally this week, I want to draw attention to the women's rugby squad at the University of Virginia, where my niece, Meredith Maxey, is kicking ass and taking names. The Cavs play their next game on March 18th against Phoenixville, and I encourage everyone in that area to head on over to the UVA campus and cheer them on. You go, Mare Mare. And that's it, folks. That's all for Season 2, Episode 2 of The Rugby Report. Until next time, remember... Four out of five dentists recommend watching more rugby. And that fifth one really doesn't know what he's talking about. See you next time. Is it better this way? It's better this way. Some of that's got to end up in a blooper reel, right? I'm ready, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm delighted to inform you that I'm going to do that again because I had that written the way I did for a reason. One more time. Staters, the most dominant team in the league. Blah. Start off with a blooper is what we're going to do. <laughs> Next up, we head down to Dunedin where my Highlanders were good. Uh, where my Highlanders, well, you know what? And kind of sums up the game in a way, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right, one more time. <laughs> the biggest absence, pun intended, would be Taniela Tupo, who shocked the rugby... Huh. Almost had it. Maybe a bit of tea. Maybe tea will help. Oh, tea helps. Next up, we head into... The 20-year-old... The, the 20... Game 2 features the hometown... Uh, you know what? Before the, the Game 2 features anything, Game 2 is going to feature some tea first. That's what it's going to do. The Force barely took down their arch nemesis... The nem... nem, nem it's arch nem... It's anemone. America has many anemones. Some of them are domesticated. The rest of them are over-seasoned. Okay. <clears throat> One more time. And really, the most exciting race is still for that last... Uh, Again, I wrote the script. <laughs> I'm supposed to know what it says.